Welcome to 340B Insight from 340B Health. Hello from Washington, D.C., and welcome back to 340B Insight, the podcast about the 340B drug pricing program. I'm David Glendinning with 340B Health. Our guest today is Caroline Steinberg, Vice President of Research and Policy Analytics here at 340B Health. Drug company restrictions on hospital access to 340B pricing through contract pharmacy arrangements continue to be a top issue for the 340B community. We recently released a report looking at the financial effects these restrictions are having on hospitals and how those cuts are affecting patient care. We wanted to hear about some of the key details of that report from its author. Before we go to that discussion, let's take a minute to cover some of the latest news about 340B. Three B Health recently was joined by two other hospital associations in opposition to a drug industry attempt to invalidate part of a Three Forty B non discrimination law in Arkansas. We filed a joint brief in a federal appeals court, along with the American Hospital Association and the Arkansas Hospital Association. The brief argues in favor of a first of its kind state law that not only prohibits discriminatory payment policies against Three Forty B providers in the state but also bans drug maker contract pharmacy restrictions on those providers. The Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma for short, is challenging the contract pharmacy portion of the law on constitutional grounds, and our brief argues that it does not conflict with federal law. You can read our joint statement about this court development by visiting the show notes. And now for our feature interview with our own Caroline Steinberg. Miles Goldman recently sat down with Caroline to discuss 340B Health's recent report on how restrictions on the use of 340B contract pharmacies are affecting hospital finances, as well as their ability to serve patients in need using 340B resources. Here's that conversation. Thank you, David. I'm joined by my colleague at 340B Health, Caroline Steinberg, Caroline, it has been a while since we have spoken with you about 340B research on the podcast, but we knew there was no better time to speak with you than following the recent release of a new 340B health report on the impact of drug companies' 340B pricing restrictions. Welcome back to 340B Insight. Thank you, Miles. It's great to be here. You're our expert at 340B health on all things research. Tell us more about this contract pharmacy report that 340B Health released. How did you put it together and and what data did you use? We had two primary sources of data. First, we submitted a Freedom of Information Act request to HRSA to obtain data on the volume for each restricted drug dispensed to 340B hospitals in 2020 and 2021. We coupled this with data that we collected from members on the value of the 340B discount. Um, And we calculate the value of the discount as the difference between a hospital purchasing at the group purchasing organization price, the price that they would have in the absence of the program um, versus the 340B ceiling price. And so this data allows us to calculate the total value of the discount associated with each drug at the NDC level and then track how that changes over time alongside the pattern of restrictions. Second, we conducted a survey of our members that asked about trends in 340B savings and asked about issues with the whole data submission process that's associated with the contract pharmacy restrictions. It asked about the impact of the lost savings on programs and services funded by 340B, as well as the direct impact of these restrictions on patients who are no longer able to access affordable medication at community pharmacies. We had a record response rate to the survey of 633 responses. This is a testament to the importance of the contract pharmacy issue to our members. How have drug company 340B restrictions affected hospitals financially? 
The data from HRSA covered 2020 and 2021. So it allowed us to look at how 340B savings changed for the five manufacturers that had restrictions in place for all of 21. These were Novartis, Lilly, Novo Nordisk, AstraZeneca, and Sanofi. These organizations account for about 20% of the savings on restricted drugs. For just these five manufacturers, 340B savings dropped by $1.1 billion in 2021. So this is a, a one-year number. So with all 21 manufacturers included, we would expect the drop to be in the multiple billions of dollars. We believe this estimate is on the low end because savings for manufacturers who had not yet imposed restrictions was trending up. And that means that in the absence of restrictions, savings likely would have been higher in 2021 versus 2020. Also, there were actually some restrictions that went into place um, during 2020 towards the end of the year, which means there was already some lost savings in 2020 that we're not accounting for in our analysis. And when you mention estimating the loss as being billions, are we talking in terms of in the last few years, or are we talking on an annual basis? We're talking on an annual basis. So we've talked about what this means financially to hospitals. What do 340B pricing restrictions mean for drug companies financially when they stop offering 340B discounts? Well, $1.1 billion is a big number for safety net hospitals that operate on very thin margins, but it's a very small number for pharmaceutical companies. $1.1 billion is less than 1% of the $176 billion in U.S. sales for these five companies. So you clearly did a lot of analysis of the various restrictive policies that are uh, out there from the different companies. Were there any patterns you found in the drugs that companies targeted? Absolutely. There were definite patterns. We found that the vast majority of drugs fell into one of two categories. First, many drugs that were restricted were nominally priced, which we define as having a discount of 85% or more. And this happens because there's an inflation penalty that is built into the 340B ceiling price formula so that drug companies that consistently raise their prices at rates greater than inflation incur a penalty, which can lead a drug to be priced at as low as a penny a unit. Across the 21 manufacturers, these nominally priced drugs account for more than half of the 340B discount. And these penalties have been shown to constrain manufacturer price increases. This is, of course, why Congress put them in place in the first place. And this factors into price increases across all payers. So manufacturers screening the penalties through these restrictions is a big deal beyond just 340B hospitals. And then second, restrictions allow drug companies to avoid paying discounts on specialty drugs. And specialty drugs are very expensive drugs that are used to treat chronic, serious, and life-threatening conditions such as cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, and MS. And because the, these drugs are so costly, even the basic 23.1% discount is big in absolute dollar terms. And because most hospitals don't have their own specialty pharmacies, restricting contract pharmacy is a very effective way for manufacturers to circumvent these discounts. So for 12 of the manufacturers with restrictions in place, specialty drugs account for more than 80% of the discount. And I'll also mention that there are some drugs that fall into both categories. Humira, which is one of the best-selling drugs, is a specialty drug, and it has had a long history of excessive price increases that have landed it into the category of being nominally priced, but at the same time, it is a very expensive um, specialty drug. How have the financial losses you've been describing to hospitals in their 340B savings affected their ability to care for patients? 
Like I said, the $1.1 billion impact from the first five is really just the tip of the iceberg. So as I said earlier, the, the actual impact of this in 2022 was likely to be many billions of dollars. So one in five hospitals from our survey report that they have already had to make cuts in programs and services, and nine in 10 report that they will have to do so if these cuts continue. And I mean, this is something that hospitals really, really try to avoid doing. So, and then the situation for critical access hospitals is even worse. Critical access hospitals are small rural hospitals that operate on very thin margins. And rural hospitals in general have seen a lot of closures in recent years. Many critical access hospitals don't have the resources to operate their own retail pharmacies, which makes them more dependent on relationships with community pharmacies. In fact, on average, over half of the 340B savings for critical access hospitals comes from contract pharmacy. And three quarters of th critical access hospitals report that 340B savings overall keeps the doors open. The clinical areas most at risk include oncology, diabetes. These are all areas where 340B savings frequently fund services and support for patients beyond just helping to pay for drugs. And these are things like medication management, which helps to improve medication adherence and outcomes. We have discussed before on the podcast how 340B discounts enable many hospitals to offer low-income patients free or discounted drugs, you know, patient assistance programs, as you just mentioned, and many also do so through their community pharmacy partners. What did the survey find out about how restrictions impact these assistance programs? Simply put, patients are losing access to critical medications. They face logistical challenges. If the only remaining contract pharmacy is a city bus ride away, or perhaps 30 or 50 miles away for patients living in rural areas. Um, some patients have lost access to drugs for a period of time. Some have lost access entirely. We will get to the data submission issues later and how that impacts pricing and can make it variable over time. But if a patient goes to a pharmacy, that has lost access to 340B pricing at any point in time, and they cannot get the discount, many will not pick up the drug. And there are many drugs like insulin or psychiatric medications where you just can't skip a dose. We also have heard a lot from hospitals about drug company policies that require them to submit patient drug claims data, as you just mentioned, as a condition of receiving 340B discounts. What did the surveyed hospitals report about their experiences with these data claims conditions? Very problematic, in a word. Having 21 different manufacturers impose their own data submission requirements that are varying, inconsistent, and sometimes not even entirely clear is taking up an inordinate amount of resources. It's reducing the savings. And frankly, raising questions about whether the manufacturers even intend for this to work. And of course, now we are beginning to see manufacturers pull back from the data submission option entirely. It requires hospitals to be constantly vigilant to identify and resolve issues when pricing goes missing at some pharmacies, but not others, and that sometimes pricing is dropped without explanation entirely. And then there's some limits on replenishments that pose a problem for smaller hospitals, as well as for expensive drugs that are not used that often. Are hospitals reporting any effects on patient care from the data reporting conditions? Yes. These efforts are diverting resources. Many people don't realize all the things that pharmacy staff do besides just dispensing drugs. For example, pharmacy staff spend significant amounts of time helping patients with pre-authorization requirements or applying for patient assistance programs. And these are the types of activities that are at risk of getting crowded out. You mentioned that more than 600 hospitals responded to the survey. Can you share any of their stories about patient harm from all these restrictions and conditions? We do have some stories of patient harm related to patients receiving low-cost drugs at contract pharmacies. 
Uh, let me preface this by saying many low-income, uninsured people lack the time and resources to travel far from their work at homes, oftentimes passing by many pharmacies to a single location that has been company approved where they can get their drugs. When that is the only option, that's when harm occurs. The first story I have was a patient at a 340B hospital in Newport News, Virginia. He had been getting his insulin for less than $10 through the hospital's relationship with a contract pharmacy near his home. With the restrictions, his cost skyrocketed to $191, and he opted to put off refilling his insulin over the weekend after he had been discharged from the hospital, and within two days, he was readmitted with an uncontrolled blood sugar level. The second is from a critical access hospital in Kansas. This hospital serves a large rural area and had had multiple relationships with contract pharmacies to provide different options for patients to fill the prescriptions without having to drive up to an hour. And choosing one pharmacy was very difficult for this hospital. And so this resulted in a number of patients delaying or foregoing their insulin now because it was hundreds of dollars. And several of these patients ended up in the emergency department with uncontrolled diabetes. Caroline, clearly there is a lot for 340B hospitals and policymakers to digest when reading this report. And we appreciate you taking the time to help walk us through it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Miles. My pleasure. Our thanks again to Caroline Steinberg for walking us through our latest report on the 340B contract pharmacy dispute and for always providing us with the data we need to better understand 340B developments. Please be sure to visit the show notes to access the full report as well as a handy one-page infographic that outlines some of its main conclusions. We enjoyed meeting so many of you at the most recent 340B Coalition Winter Conference in San Diego and we would like to meet even more of you at the upcoming summer conference here in the nation's capital. Registration recently opened for this must-attend event, which will occur July 10th to 12th in National Harbor, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. So be sure to save the dates and sign up today. Early bird registration discounts expire May 19th. We will see you here. And we will be back in a few weeks with our next episode. In the meantime, as always, thanks for listening and be well. Thanks for listening to 340B Insight. Subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information, visit our website at 340bpodcast.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at 340B Health and submit a question or idea to the show by emailing us at podcast at 340bhealth.org.